Okay, now we can get started. It's exactly 3 p.m. Uh, Central European summertime. Um, so, uh, hello everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. We have over 80 people uh, online at the moment following this webinar uh, on project-based learning as a method for 21st century skills. Um, so, uh, I'll just make sure that you can hear me. Just there. Okay, yes, it was. And, <laughs> and we're also recording. Perfect, over 90 people right now, great. <laughs> so uh, my name is Nicole, uh, I'm the International Legal Schools Coordinator at the Foundation for Environmental Education and I will be facilitating today's uh, webinar. Um, so we've uh, launched this uh, series of webinars since November last year to help uh, teachers and the, the network are, uh, of, um, of schools participating in uh, fee programs to build their skills and capacity. Um, so just a few uh, rules. <laughs> oh, there we go. Um, so first of all, it's important that uh, you need to keep yourselves muted. Please do not unmute yourselves during the presentation. If you have any questions or any comments, you can always use the chat. Uh, today we're talking about project-based learning. After the presentation uh, by Susie Boss, there will be time for questions. Uh, so we will be looking at the chat uh, and also any questions that come up uh, at the end. Uh, if you have any other requests, please again, use the chat um, to do so. Uh, and if there's uh, not enough time to answer all the questions during the webinar, we will look um, through them and make sure that we, you get answers by email. Diplomas, this is important. Uh, some, I can already see that uh, some of you have already done this. Uh, you're trained already. So uh, if you want to receive a diploma for participation uh, to this uh, webinar, uh, please write your name uh, and your email address to Gozia. You can find her in the chat. Uh, so you can do so using the private chat function and only send it to um, Gozia. Uh, so we will collect all these requests and send you a diploma later on. Uh, make sure you give us uh, new ideas for our next webinars uh, and of course we are recording this session so you, uh, you're also welcome to uh, watch it later or forward it to a friend who uh, wanted to take a look and didn't have the time. Uh, and last but not least, uh, we as, I, as I said, this is a series of webinars so we're, we're hosting um, the same session again uh, on the 21st of April. This will be the same webinar as today and then later in May we have another webinar on fostering civic participation through agriculture education. Uh, we're also looking for teachers, uh, in fact, uh, to present alongside our main speaker on this webinar. So if you're interested, please let us know. And then the second one in May is the mental and physical benefits of outdoor education. And you can find more information on our webinar page, uh, as you can see on the screen. Uh, now a little bit about the speaker. I will also let Susie introduce her, herself, but uh, just to, to briefly mention that she's a writer and a consultant from the US, uh, focusing on the power of teaching and learning to improve okay. lives and transform, transform communities. She's a frequent contributor to Edutopia, uh, she might talk a little bit about uh, this uh, during her speech. Uh, and she's also a member of uh, PBL Works uh, National Faculty. Um, so I'll just uh, stop sharing and then um, uh, Susie can also um, how do I stop this. <laughs> yes, hi, um, Nicole. Thank you. Yes, just give me a moment to get my um, screen shared and I think we'll be good to go. Great. Okay. Um, are you seeing what you should be seeing, Nicole? Yes, we are. Uh, it's not on slideshow mode yet, but. Well, let's go to full screen. There we go. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Good. Great. Okay. Wonderful. Well, first of all, thank you for the invitation to join you um, today. Just in looking at the chat, I, I'm amazed by what an international group this is. And it's exciting to see so many people um, interested in the topic of project-based learning and 21st century skills. So let's jump right in. As Nicole mentioned, we'll have a chance to talk about some of your questions at the end. I'll talk for about half hour and then uh, we'll, we'll find out how else we can deepen your understanding of project-based learning. So as Nicole mentioned, uh, I'm from the US. Home for me is Portland, Oregon in the upper left corner there. 
Um, my work in project-based learning, though, has really taken me all over the globe. Many of the countries that I see represented in the chat are places where I've worked with teachers uh, interested in bringing project-based learning to their students. In many cases, it's part of a school-wide initiative to make learning more student-centered. Um, uh, my most recent trips were to India, the photo that you see in the, the bottom right there. And then I saw someone in the chat from Colombia. I was just in um, Cartagena um, right before all travel ceased for my, <laughs> my global consulting work. So um, I'm working from home these days in Portland, Oregon. And as Nicole mentioned, I, I contribute regularly to Edutopia. If you're not familiar with that, it's the publishing um, philanthropy uh, from George Lucas, the filmmaker. Uh, with a real focus on the kind of education that serves the needs of students around the world. So if you're looking for examples, you want to see great videos of project-based learning in action, um, Edutopia is a good place to check out. And I'll also be talking today a little bit about an organization called PBL Works, based in the U.S., but again with a global reach and with a focus on bringing high-quality learning experiences to students all around the world through project-based learning. I've written a number of books um, on the topic, and these are a few that I'll be uh, drawing on today as we dig in. So I wanted to start just by kind of really going big picture and, and think about why project-based learning might be a good fit for your students, and particularly why right now when we're in the middle of this very unusual circumstance with our students and many of us having to work with students um, in ways that we haven't before. A lot of distance learning happening um, on very short notice for educators around the world. Um, when I work with teachers interested in, in uh, shifting to project-based learning, adopting these kinds of strategies, we often start by thinking, what is it that you're trying to get to? By the time your students are through with their educational experience with you, what sorts of skills, competencies, knowledge do you want them to take away? How would you describe them as accomplished young people of the near future? And the words that you see on this photo are the ones that most often come up. Um, we're looking for our students to be problem solvers, to be collaborative and creative, creative, to be curious about the world and passionate about what they're learning, to be connected globally, and on and on in that vein. I think why are these so important right now um, is evident to anyone who's struggling to get through this strange time that we're in or who's paying attention to the news every day when we're watching adults wrestling with how do we solve a really complicated global problem? How do we get folks um, from all kinds of different disciplines to collaborate and come up with solutions uh, on, on very short notice, um, no notice in some cases? How do we get people to change their behavior and communicate what's important for them to know about health and safety? Um, so I think that, um, you know, all of these are the sorts of competencies we want to develop in students today so that when it's their turn, we hope this doesn't happen for them as adults, but whatever challenges are ahead for them, um, they're going to have the skills to, to really tackle those challenges and come up with solutions. As one teacher colleague um, told me a comment that really stuck with me, she said, why does it make sense to educate our students about the world's problems, about things like climate change, if we're not going to give them the tools and strategies to tackle them and come up with solutions? Uh, we need to do both. We need to educate about issues and we need to empower students to be ready to take action. And that's what project-based learning is all about. It's about learning by doing and about applying what you know to um, address a challenge or solve a problem. So let's dig in a little bit. Um, I want to find out um, who's with us uh, in the chat if you'd like to. I'm curious kind of what your own project-based uh, learning background is. For some teachers, this is something new and you might just be reading up on it for the first time. So I call you an armchair traveler. You're like getting someone getting ready for an adventure that you haven't taken yet. And you wonder if this is going to be a good journey. So perhaps you're reading about it. You might be setting out on your very first project. So we'll call you a tenderfoot. Uh, if you're an explorer, you're someone who has done a few projects and now you've got different sorts of questions than perhaps you had the first time around, deeper questions. Or maybe you're someone who's a scout who can guide and teach others. Um, I work with teachers at all across this spectrum 
uh, and there's room for growth no matter where you're starting. So um, if you'd like to use the chat a little bit and connect with your colleagues who are part of the webinar today, uh, let each other know kind of what your experience is using this shorthand. And as you're doing that, I'm going to set the stage for today by focusing uh, on our driving question. Uh, most projects, if you've done project-based learning, you know, most projects start with a driving question that kind of frames the learning experience ahead. So in that spirit, I've got a driving question for us today, which is how can we develop students' 21st century skills by focusing on key features of PBL? Again, I think this is really apt and appropriate for the times that we find ourselves in right now. So as we think about project-based learning, it's important to think about designing projects for really high quality learning experiences. Um, you know, there's no point in doing projects that don't reach the full potential of what PBL has to offer. So when you think about what qualities do good projects share, again, if you feel like using the chat and engaging with your um, fellow participants, this is a great question for you to um, kind of talk about in the chat. Um, when you think about high quality project-based learning, what are those qualities that you see regardless of content area or regardless of the student's age um, that really make for a good learning experience? And I'm gonna dig into this question um, uh, with a little bit of uh, information from the organization I mentioned earlier, PBL Works. Um, this organization, um, I'm, I'm part of their national faculty. And as a big research project, we took this on as our own project-based learning. It's a big research project. We, we focused hard on this question of why is it that some projects seem to um, exceed uh, all expectations and students just have the best learning experience you could imagine through PBL. And other times you might look at evidence of a project or talk to students afterwards and you wonder, boy, was it really worth the time? Um, it might have been fun, but it really accomplish anything that's going to be important for students to take away, or did it get them to some deep understanding that will stay with them? And there's a, uh, quite a range when we look at projects and the quality of the learning experience. So as an organization, PBL Works focused on establishing what they call the gold standard for project-based learning to give teachers something to aim toward when you're designing a project what should you have in mind that will set the stage for the best possible learning experience for your students? I'm going to talk through this just briefly. If you're interested in learning more, um, the book that you see in the bottom right cor corner goes into great detail about the gold standard. And there's a lot of information on the website, pblworks.org, that you see in the, the lower left. But basically, if you think of this framework as a camera lens, right at the center focus, right in the middle of the circle, are the learning goals. So that tells us that project-based learning needs to be about something. It needs to have some learning goals. So for those of us who have um, either a national curriculum or standards that we align to, this is where you think about the academic outcomes of the project, but you also think about uh, what PBL Works calls success skills. And this is where we find 21st century skills. Success skills are those competencies like collaboration, communication, critical thinking that carry over from one project to another and right into life that are appropriate um, across all content areas and that really set students up for success wherever they're heading next, um, whether it's going to be college or as active citizens um, or uh, in their future careers. These are the kind of essential skills um, of the 21st century. And so good projects focus on both things. This is one of the benefits of project-based learning. It's a, um, a strategy to accomplish not only deep learning on the academic side, but also to intentionally teach and develop student success skills by really focusing in on those. And then everything that you see in this circle around the outside as, is of equal importance for helping students reach those deep learning goals. Projects start with a challenging problem or question, like the driving question we just um, uh, introduced today with. Um, there's a lot of questioning, sustained inquiry, research that goes into uh, understanding what that question is all about. Good projects have a ring of authenticity. Students uh, like projects that connect to the real world. This is something that they tell us makes project particularly, uh, makes learning particularly engaging for them if it feels authentic, if it feels like it's the real world and not just an assignment for class. Um, good projects 
allow students to use their voice and make decisions. They also encourage students to reflect on their learning, not just at the end, looking back, but all along the way as they're going through the project experience. And at key times in that learning experience, students get feedback and time to use that feedback to improve their work and address misconceptions perhaps in their thinking. So we think about critique and revision as being really essential to project-based learning. All of those things get students to the place where at the end of the project, they've taken that great learning that they have acquired, they've applied it to solve a problem, or address, uh, come up with a new solution or an idea, and they share that publicly with an audience that's gonna care about it. That's the public product idea. And for many students, we find that having that public product, having that public audience for their work, really increases um, the engagement, the motivation to produce uh, wonderful, beautiful work, uh, and uh, you know, just to kind of put as much of themselves into the project as they can. So engagement really ramps up when students know that this is gonna matter to someone um, beyond the classroom. Of course, it will matter to their, their teacher and their classmates as well, but having that public audience um, is a big part of the motivation. So I thought I'd share a few examples just to paint a picture and I've looked for some recent examples I've seen that have a sustainability or an environmental education focus. Um, these are not hard to find. Many, many project examples that I see around the world have an environmental or sustainability focus. This one involves very young learners and they're thinking about environment around their own campus and they're wondering how they can make their campus um, into a more inviting habitat for birds. This is something that they'd like to see happen. So it's causing them to really learn and think deeply about habitats um, and ecosystems and all of that stuff that's in their, their content area. But it's also forcing them to think about collaboration because to really do a good assay, um, take stock of what's growing and living on the campus, it takes a, a big uh, crew of students to tackle this. This is a big job, so they have to learn how to work together. And in doing the project, they're developing their collaboration skills along with their content understanding. Another project, the previous example uh, around ecosystems was from Ecuador. Uh, this is an example from the US. And it, it grew out of um, what was not intended to be a project at all. It was sort of a memorization activity involving worksheets. And students were learning the symbols of their region, of their state. And one student noticed that there was no insect on the list of state symbols. There was a butterfly and there was a bird, there was a mineral, but there was no state insect. And they raised um, the question of, should we have a state insect? And, and what would that accomplish? What's involved in all of that? That was the launch of a really interesting project that took them into a, a, a deep learning experience where they thought about um, the insects in their environment, um, how they contribute um, to the health of an environment. Um, they came up with a great candidate, an endangered um, beetle that does a lot to replenish the soil in their region. And then they went through the whole process of figuring out how do we get this designated as our state insect? And what you see is the bill that these elementary students wrote um, being enacted into law, being signed into law. So pretty powerful results for these students. A different sort of example, these students are thinking about tiny houses, which are popular now in the US. Uh, these are very small footprint homes. We're seeing them in highly um, densely populated areas as alternative housing. Um, uh, they have, of course, a very small um, carbon footprint. Uh, they're very energy efficient. And as a, a project that combined uh, geometry, understanding the, the scale and measurement uh, and design and communication skills, um, students in this particular project were thinking about how can we design a, a tiny house for a real client. Now they didn't actually go through building um, the actual houses, uh, but they did come up with blueprints and 3D models and they presented them to their clients. And these were clients they had interviewed previously to find out what are the needs of these clients? What's their budget? Uh, why are they interested in a tiny house in the first place? And how can we design a tiny house to really uh, suit their needs? And so in this project, not only were they learning on the academic side about measurement and modeling and architecture uh, and design, but they were also having to think critically they were thinking about what are the best features to incorporate? How can we meet the needs of our client on a budget? 
So you can see how both sorts of skills, the academic side and the 21st century side, were developing um, right in tandem. Um, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about where these project ideas come from. Some teachers who are getting started with this uh, sometimes wonder, where do I come up with ideas? Um, especially if this is a new way of teaching and learning. And, you know, let's be honest, for most of us, this is a new way of teaching and learning. It's probably not the way school looked um, for you, unless you were one of the lucky ones who got to experience this kind of learning yourself um, as a student. So one good starting place is to look at your standards and think about who uses these big ideas in the world outside of school? How do our learning goals apply to real life? Um, we're seeing great examples every day if you're a math teacher and you're seeing uh, graphs and uh, trajectories and math modeling being uh, displayed and discussed every single day in the news. It's certainly the case um, here in the US. Math is right in front of us in ways uh, that I, I just can't remember it ever being before. Um, but looking at your standards and thinking about what are the big ideas of my content area and who uses these in the world? How do they go about problem solving? That can be an idea, uh, a starting place for ideas. And also looking to see how have other teachers uh, gone about designing projects. Um, adapting, borrowing and adapting ideas from others in the PBL community is a really smart starting point. Um, this uh, photo you see on the screen is from a math teacher in the US. Um, and she uh, did a project where students were in the role of financial planners, um, using their understanding of pre-calculus to come up with very solid uh, financial plans full of mathematical calculations uh, for actual clients. And she came up with this project by doing these two things, looking at her standards, thinking about what students needed to understand about uh, functions, and then um, thinking about who does this in the real world, who uses math in this way. And of course, financial planners um, are the sorts of folks who do. You can see her video and several more um, start to finish videos at pblworks.org to get an idea of how do projects flow? What do they look like from start to finish? Another starting point is to just really listen to your students' questions and concerns. This is an example of a, a project from very young learners. These were kindergartners who were concerned about problems in their environment. And by their environment, they meant their own play area on their campus. This is the environment uh, that they spend their, um, their recess time in. They've done a lot of care and tending of features of that environment. And they weren't happy with the way that others were treating it. And so they wanted to do a project about the environment, which is part of their content goals, but really focused on how can we get others to pitch in and uh, take care of our environment in the, in the way that we all care about. And this began with students' observations and questions and use their um, e you know, emerging literacy skills as uh, speakers and listeners and readers and writers to come up with a really compelling project where they um, convinced others to join them in taking care of their environment. And another very likely place to find good project ideas is to connect to current events and issues that are in the world all around us. Of course, um, there's no shortage of those right now, and I'm seeing creative teachers work with their students on everything from um, keeping uh, uh, diaries and journals um, about what it's like to, to have to uh, shelter in place during this epidemic. Um, realizing that these journals and, and perhaps some sketches and drawings and family interviews, these might become useful someday in the future when historians want to look back and think about how did society adapt to this particular challenge. Um, students are realizing that the work they're doing might be the first draft of history someday. Other students are, are thinking about how can we convince others to stay safe or to um, follow um, hand washing guidelines. And so they're thinking about ways to communicate those ideas. These sorts of projects um, are beginning to emerge even in remote learning situations where teachers and students are not in the same classroom, but they're focused on solving the same sorts of problems together. So thinking about connecting to current events and issues, the photo you see here um, is from a high school chemistry project where students took on the issue of um, keeping lead out of the drinking water particular um, problem, big problem in a city in the US, Flint, Michigan, with lead in the drinking water. 
these students were applying their understanding of chemistry to think about what's the best way to prevent that from happening. And thinking about the larger issue of why does this sort of issue seem to happen more often in um, low income communities. So they really also address the issue of environmental racism and got into uh, critical thinking uh, strategies when they came up with solutions for ways to prevent this from happening in the future, thinking about cause and effect and the other things that are involved in critical thinking. So very timely, relevant uh, topic for students who felt like they were contributing um, to an ongoing problem, that the work that they had done in their own chemistry class perhaps could make life safer for others in the community in the future. And then I wanted to mention um, a colleague of mine, um, Stephen Ritz is an educator from New York City, the Bronx in New York, but he, he also has quite a global reach. He works with educators around the world who are interested in greening their classroom, and in particular in using the idea of bringing fresh, healthy food to our communities as a focus um, of project-based learning. So he works with uh, students of all ages in all kinds of settings. You see behind him some of the uh, vertical gardens, tower gardens that he uses uh, for indoor farming uh, with students in a school in the Bronx in New York. He also does outdoor farming uh, with other communities. Um, but the work that he's doing uh, with students connects to the global goals um, that I'm sure you're all familiar with as environmental educators. You know, thinking about um, ending hunger, uh, addressing hunger by, by making access to fresh, healthy food available and affordable in our community. So his students are doing all kinds of work um, uh, around science, around communications, around math and measurement, um, all related to growing and preparing and eating and sharing. Sharing is really important in this project, um, fresh, healthy food that they grow right in their own classroom. So thinking about those global goals and how you can make them just the right size for your students to tackle. Um, one of the dangers of project-based learning is that students might want to tackle a project or a problem that's so big they feel like they can never even make a dent in it. So how do you help them make it just the right size by maybe focusing it more narrowly or thinking about their own community and how that connects to larger issues? And a couple of strategies I wanted to kind of close with as you're involved in project-based learning, how do you keep motivation high so that students stay engaged all the way through? You might start off with a great uh, first day, a great entry event to get the questions flowing and get students excited and connected to the topic, but a project can last anywhere from a couple of weeks to a couple of months, sometimes even a fall semester. So how do you keep that engagement high um, throughout the experience? And so here are a few strategies to help you focus on. Um, one is, is to really um, amplify these essential elements that I mentioned in the gold standard, starting with authenticity. The more students feel like their work is real and that it really matters, um, the more engaged they're gonna be and the more they're gonna care about sticking with it all the way through. Uh, the students you see here are producing some educational um, documentaries for their own city. Uh, this is a city in, in the U.S., in California, and this year, sixth grade students from this school are producing documentaries about keeping plastics out of the watershed. Even though these students don't live right near the ocean, they're quite a ways inland, they really care about the big issue of plastics in our ocean. So by thinking about how can we keep plastics out of our own watershed, they're making that connection between what happens locally and what happens more globally. Um, and they're realizing all along the way that this is a project that really matters. Um, they've investigated the big um, ocean issue, ocean pollution issue, but they've also thought about what's the problem right in our own community and is it a problem that we can address, we can solve, and they're pretty sure that they've got some strategies to change public behavior. Another essential element you might, mention, you might remember uh, from my quick discussion of the gold standard was around inquiry, sustained inquiry. So one way to keep engagement high in the project is to think about how can I um, encourage students to keep asking questions and to go deeper with their questioning as the project unfolds. This uh, photo is from uh, a competition uh, that was held last year to produce podcasts. Um, our national public radio in the U.S. hosted a podcast challenge. And a little tiny school in a small state 
in the U.S. and Tennessee um, actually wound up winning the high school division. Um, and I tracked down the teachers and uh, talked to them about the project and how they'd structured it. And what was impressive to me um, was how the teachers artfully um, built in questioning each week. So every week there would be a new sort of question that student teams would really need to dig into and investigate, starting with you know, talking to people in their own community about stories worth telling, thinking about um, you know, what, what are the components of a great story. Um, they actually got some journalists in to help them vet their questions before they interviewed um, experts. And the level of questioning just went deeper and deeper throughout their project until they were ready to produce their podcast. So by the time they got to that actual production of the, um, the shows, um, they had this great uh, storehouse of, of stories to draw from. And it was all because inquiry had been a big part of the project from start to finish. And finally, I wanna remind you about the importance of student voice and choice. Um, this can come up in all kinds of ways in projects. You want to, of course, encourage students on questions. Um, but as students think about what's a product that we could produce or, or something we could demonstrate, a uh, way to take and apply our learning and solve a problem, communicate it to others, this is where you want to give students as much freedom as you're comfortable with to make some decisions themselves, to come up with choices. Um, that will show you what they know and what they can do, but will also um, show them that they can invest in their own ideas, that they have ideas um, really worth pursuing, they can make them better with critique and feedback, um, and that audiences are gonna care about the solutions they come up with. So the more student voice you can build into the project, chances are the more engagement you're gonna see all the way through. So a couple of final things to think about before we get into your questions. One is a question I hear from a lot of teachers. If project-based learning is student-centered, then what's the teacher's role? I think this is a fair question, and it gets at one of the misconceptions about project-based learning, that it's just unstructured, sort of freewheeling, open-ended, anything goes. That's really not the case. It's actually a, a very artfully designed experience where teachers put a lot of time into planning before students ever enter the picture and teachers use their best strategies to make sure that that project is going to help students address learning goals that are worth addressing, um, that there's a strong culture in the classroom that welcomes, uh, you know, everyone has a voice and ideas are welcome, um, that students receive the support they need so they get the scaffolding they need uh, they, so that they can be su successful. They're getting feedback from uh, teachers and sometimes their peers all the way through. So there's a lot of artful teaching involved in project-based learning. And just a couple of things worth remembering. One is that project-based learning isn't just one thing. It's not one teaching strategy. It's a mixture of different strategies that are appropriate at the right time. Um, some are teacher-centered, some are student-centered. But if you look at the research around uh, good teaching generally, um, not just project-based learning, but all kinds of teaching. What leads to the best outcomes? It happens when there are really high expectations for all students, so there's a high bar. Uh, there are strong relationships between student and teachers. There's frequent and helpful feedback with time to apply that. And students are actually taught ways of learning. Um, there's this kind of metacognition that happens in good teaching. And I would argue that it's impossible to do project-based learning without paying attention to these high-impact strategies. So they're all really important. And what we hear from teachers who, you know, go on this journey and get involved with project-based learning, these are some of the comments. I'll let you read these for yourselves. But my favorite of them is that um, this kind of teaching and learning reminds teachers of why they went into this profession in the first place. They often feel like they get to know their students better. Um, it's like they can see their students, you know, just growing before their eyes. Um, and I think that uh, I will close with this photo because I think it reminds us all um, of what it's like from the student perspective. Uh, when students have a chance to really um, tackle important problems, uh, these students have just taken on an issue in their own community and they've done a, um, a business uh, 
Shark Tank type pitch session, but it had to be a business idea with a sustainability focus. And they just got endorsement for their idea and a little bit of seed funding to go along with it. And I just think the, uh, the looks on their faces and that satisfaction and excitement of what they've accomplished um, reminds me of what PBL is all about. So I'm gonna close there. I haven't had a chance to look in the chat while I've been talking, but I, I look forward to do that. And I, I know Nicole is gonna jump in um, with some commentary. Yep. Thank you so much, uh, Susie. This this was uh, amazing, and uh, yeah, just uh, one uh, small contribution that I wanted to make to the, uh, to this er everything that you've described in terms of the uh, golden standard for uh, project based learning is actually reflected in the Eco Schools uh, seven steps. So, uh, for example, I've been taking some notes here. So when we talk about the sustained inquiry, we can see that in the environmental review when. Um, uh, students ultimately go through um, a, a certain uh, number of themes and they uh, basically understand their performance, uh, um, the school performance in terms of these um, subjects and how they can better tackle them, what is a priority. It allows them to reflect um, on what, they, what the real issues are and, and how they can do the, how they can actually um, yeah, tackle them through uh, an action plan and what that action plan looks like, uh, who is involved and so on. Um, uh, regarding student voice and choice, uh, I think the uh, eco committee is very, um, uh, yeah, a, a perfect reflection of that, uh, where students come together and they uh, ask for the support of their teachers and even the school management or the community, the municipal, the local municipality, and so on. Um, and yeah, again, when we're looking at the, the challenging problems or or the critique uh, and uh, and reflection, uh, there's. There's the elements of monitoring and evaluating uh, in eco schools where ultimately students have to look at the environmental review that they established in the beginning of, of their project um, and, um, and then track the progress as they go along. So the, there's all these elements that uh, kind of move on in a, cycl a cyclical way. So the, to all those of you who are implementing eco schools, you're already doing uh, project based learning to a, to a great extent. And, uh, yeah. To, to all those who don't, uh, yeah, get in touch. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know if maybe we can open the floor for uh, some questions um, or. Oh. I think there are some questions on chat, so maybe yeah. we can take them from the chat. Yes, let's see. Uh, I just scrolled up and. Okay, so there is uh, one question from. Uh, um, Laya, if I'm saying that right. Uh, so related to assessment, how is your uh, assessment process? How do you evaluate those students with special needs? Okay, that's two different questions. Yeah, okay. sure. So of course, assessment's a big topic. <laughs> we could spend another whole uh, webinar talking about just assessment. But in project-based learning, um, th there is a, um, a solid assessment plan. So there's a summative assessment by the end of this project, what should students know and be able to do? And typically teachers uh, will develop a rubric that lays out the criteria of success. And as students are involved in the project, they're using that rubric as a tool to guide their learning. So it's not just at the end that they, you know, have a test or something happens or they're asked to do something on the spot. All along the way, um, they're, you know, designing solutions and coming up with products that will rise to the level of excellence. Um, so those those criteria are communicated both on the academic side, what do students, you know, need to know to be successful in this project, as well as the success skill um, that is focus of the project. So if it's about, <clears throat> if it's a project that requires, let's say, critical thinking or perhaps collaboration is really emphasized, then that is something that teachers will also assess and communicate to students. Here's what it looks like when, when you're doing it well. And then backing up from that, um, so that's kind of where you're going in the big picture, but to help students get there, it's really important to be doing check-ins and formative assessment all along the way. Um, so you don't wait until the end of the project to do this big assessment. Students are getting feedback, um, often without grades attached while they're doing the project, just so that they're getting information, they're correcting misunderstandings, they're getting a chance to improve their work. Um, that assessment might come from the teacher, it might come from peers, it might come from outside experts who come in and give some, uh, some critique or uh, work with students to develop their products. 
Um, so they get a lot more information to guide their learning than they might in a more traditional, um, you know, more textbook sort of driven um, learning experience. Uh, but it's that combination of the learning goals, you know, knowing what you're aiming for, how will I know success when I see it, and then how do I get students there with formative assessment all along the way. And I would say that um, the second part around special needs students really thinking the same way. They might um, need some accommodation, they might need some additional scaffolding or support to be successful, but you wanna think about what are the goals that are appropriate for them, what can they accomplish um, in this project, and how do I help them uh, be successful? Those are just questions you wanna ask of every learner uh, in the classroom. Great, uh, just uh, another comment on this. Uh, you mentioned rubrics in the beginning, Susie, uh, in terms of uh, assessment of, of a project. Uh, just to mention that uh, uh, a couple of months ago uh, within EcoSchools, we released our um, uh, rubric for assessment for the seven steps for a green flag application. Uh -huh. um, so for, for those of you who weren't aware, there, there is at the moment uh, available um, this assessment rubric that basically walks you through the expectations <laughs> of, uh, of an eco schools uh, project or uh, what the key performance indicators are for each of the seven steps uh, and that can be used both as an assessment tool uh, for, for self-assessment but also as a planning tool so as uh, Susie mentioned if, if you know what the um, expected outcomes are then you can actually work towards them Exactly, that's kind of backwards planning. You know, if you know where you're going, <laughs> then you can figure yeah. out how to get there. So that's it just as a key of a, a wealth of tools to share with your, your educators, just great. Mm -hmm. uh, there is uh, one more uh, comment that maybe uh, you can comment back on. Uh, so um, talking to people from various countries led me to an understanding that current events are the core that may ignite curiosity. However, it works for the majority, which is directly involved in the events that are taking place. Um, yeah, maybe that was more of a more of a comment. comment. Yeah, and I think that you know the the key with current events is to make sure they're relevant to the students in your community. You know, thinking about mm -hmm. um, are they are they of the right age to connect with a particular issue? Um, are they developmentally ready to tackle different things? Um, if something's happening somewhere else in the world. How is that going to be relevant to their lives? How can you make that bridge? Um, so, you know, again, as a teacher, you think critically about your own students and what they're ready for, and how do I connect this to their lives and their cultures is often a big, um, a big question as well. Actually, connected to this, uh, I know it's a hard question to to answer, but how could a teacher actually implement uh, PBL remotely in these times? Oh. Yes, and you know, some brave teachers are, are doing just that. Um, the ones who um, seem to be off to the fastest start with that are teachers who had already been doing project-based learning in their classes, and so as they shifted to remote experiences, they already had strong relationships with their students, and they already had some strategies in place for how to manage, you know, your own learning, how to structure a project. So that's, a, we're seeing some adaptations of projects as, as teachers are working that way. What seems to be really important for that to continue are frequent check-ins with students. So a lot of calls like this, a lot of Zoom meetings with students, um, checking in on kind of what's their progress. They're having to work much more independently um, than when they were in the same classroom with the same students, um, you know, collaborating with a, a a fellow student is harder in this time when we're all social isolating and social distancing. Uh, so we're having to be more creative in our use of communications tools and strategies. Um, but I, I think the other thing teachers can think about is um, not overcomplicating what project-based learning might look like in a distance learning situation. If you want to give your students a chance to um, get a little taste of this uh, kind of learning now in a distance learning situation out of necessity, you know, find out what questions are on their minds. What are they really curious about? What are they wondering about? How are they solving the challenges and what challenges do they notice around their own households? So things like um, here in the US, we're encouraged not to go to the grocery store unless absolutely necessary. Keep our errands, you know, to a minimum. So how are families navigating that? Um, how could you come up with a plan to help your family Make food last for 10 days um, if you haven't had to do it, if you're used to running to the store, you know, every time that it's convenient. Um, that's a little mini project 
but it would give students a taste of how do I go about analyzing a problem? How do I go about gathering some data, which they would do in their own household? Um, what would I come up with as a plan? Um, so some simple things, but that might be addressing, you know, real problems they're experiencing at home. Problems don't have to be global size. Uh, they can be, you know, um, challenges that students are facing in their own, you know, how do I spend my day when I don't go to school? What should my, you know, how do I stay healthy or how do I stay fit if I can't play my favorite sport? Those are the sorts of questions that are probably on many students' minds. So giving them a taste of problem solving strategies now, then when you eventually are back together, you know, as more of a uh, classroom unit, you can think about, remember when we had that time when you were all working from home and you had to think about asking questions, gathering information, um, coming up with solutions, you know, we're gonna do more of that now, but maybe in a little more academic way. So I think kind of keeping their curiosity going, um, and for many students, just letting them feel like there are problems they can actually solve right now. Many of our students we know are feeling really pretty helpless. You know, this is um, a big uh, challenging time that we're all facing, so if you can give students little tastes of something that feels successful or that they've made a difference in someone else's life, um, is there, you know, a first responder that they could help in some way or, you know, do they know a nurse uh, who would really benefit from something that would cheer them up? Um, what is it that they could do? Um, I, I was just on an, another call last week uh, with some students and one of them said the thing she missed most about not being in school every day was that her school did a lot of service projects and she really values giving back and giving to others and so she's looking for ways now that she's a little more isolated and doing remote learning, how can I continue being of service? Um, uh, and, you know, I think that just um, speaks to the, really speaks to the heart. But, but if you can kind of change your thinking about what's, what's um, a good ambition for a project we could do under these new circumstances, and then think about some of the same strategies. You know, how do you ask good questions? How do you do research? How do you communicate what you find out? Um, who's going to care about your... Uh, your solution, your, your ideas. Um, those are all things you can start testing out um, now when we're in this weird situation. <laughs> Definitely. As you, as you said, keeping engagement high is important and you've just given some really good examples on how, how to do so. Thank you very much for that. Sure. Um, uh, I'll move on to the next question from Mark Jones. Uh, you talked about planning. Do you have any suggestions of good examples of what this might look like, the level of uh, scaffolding, especially for young, younger children? Sure. Um, I mentioned pblworks.org, um, and that's a, a resource that uh, has lots of free resources um, for educators. So you can download planning um, tools there, some samples of, of plans from start to finish. Um, some of the books that I mentioned have samples of plans in them um, as well. But I think taking a look at someone else's plan uh, it really gives you a good sense of, you know, how much do I need to think about? Um, what are some good ways to, you know, anticipate scaffolds? And again, as you think about scaffolding for a project, keep using the things that work really well for you um, as a teacher. You know, if you have some favorite um, graphic organizers or uh, ways to help students, um, you know, sentence stems to lead them to better um, conversations um, or ways to ask questions. You know, you keep using those. It's just that in project-based learning, you're using them in the context of the project. Great. Um, next question from uh, Dilip. Uh, I'm very happy to see a lot of uh, uh, names from the International Schools Coordinators. I recognize you. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> um, so how many projects does, uh, do the students do in a year? Uh, That's a really good question, yeah. And, and also, and, if, I, if I may combine it to the next, what material can teachers use in this time? Okay, sure. Um, so it's a good question about how much PBL to do. And, and we see a wide range. There are some schools, I would say it's a minority of schools, but there are some schools that do all project-based learning for all their instruction. And they tend to do interdisciplinary projects. So in these schools, you see a lot of teacher teaming and teachers designing projects together across disciplinary areas. Um, those are more unusual. I would say that's not the norm. What's more common is for um, teachers who were um, kind of embracing project-based learning to do at least a couple projects per semester. 
um, and they, they might be shorter, they won't last the whole semester, and then in between, maybe more traditional units that you've taught, you know, before, as you kind of make this, um, make this evolution. Um, and it, for, uh, for students also, that, that gives, um, it can be a little bit exhausting for students to go from one big project to another big project to another, so it gives a little bit more of an ebb and flow. Um, from project to project if you space them out a little bit. But we find that if students have um, at least a couple uh, project experiences each year, then their ability to do more complex work increases as they get older. So each new project, they're not having to learn how to collaborate uh, or how to give a presentation because they've worked on that previously. Now they can really focus on you know, more rigorous academic goals or maybe a more um, wrestle with a, a bigger issue that they want to challenge because they feel like they're ready for that. They've got some of those other 21st century skills pretty well developed and they can continue using them. So just, you know, I would say um, what's important is to, um, to get started, to give it a try, and then not to give up after your first project because um, they all get better with practice. Um, so for you and your students both, it's a, a bit of a learning journey um, and, and to, Reflect on what's worked well for your students, get them to reflect about it, give you feedback as the teacher if you were going to do this project again, you know, what would you change, what would you stay the same, um, and just have that sort of conversation with your students that, you know, we're kind of all in this together and we're all learning something um, new and exciting together. Great. Uh, I, there's a couple of questions related to uh, resources. Uh, so what kind of resources would you recommend for beginners in PBL and uh, also can we find lesson plans and class resources available in the PBL Works uh, website or another website? Sure, and, and again the PBL Works website, so it's pblworks.org. Yes, there are, you know, examples of plans there. There's a project library where you can, you know, really click in and get a good look at different projects, search by grade levels and um, content areas, so that's a good starting point. Um, I mentioned Edutopia, and that's edutopia.org. Um, again, lots and lots of resources there, both video case studies of projects, um, and lots of uh, blogs by you know, myself and others who write about project-based learning. Um, there, there's also an organization called um, uh, EL, uh, just the letters EL Education, uh, in the US, it used to be called Expeditionary Learning, and now it's called EL Education. They maintain a really nice library of uh, project examples. Um, and you can take a look at the student work that was produced. You can see the teacher reflections. You can learn about uh, you know, how the project was designed. So there's lots and lots of material out there to help you um, get off to a fast start. And of course, I've written a number of books on the topic, and they all are full of examples and um, uh, kind of guide you through the process of thinking about designing a project. Great, thank you. So a little bit of uh, interaction time. I'll jump on to Mentimeter uh, like we normally do. We have some questions for you. So I'll just share my uh, screen. Um, do I need to stop sharing mine? Maybe? Uh, I think it's okay. I think it will just go onto mine. Onto mine. Okay. Uh, there we go. And Okay, so everyone, go on to www.menti.com and use the code that you can see uh, up here. Um, I'll do that myself. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, once you do that, um, you can answer the question, what is your uh, next idea for a project? And you can definitely think about your uh, eco-schools activities, the action plans that maybe your eco-committees have already come up with. Uh, so what is the uh, one thing that the, you can take um, and, and then create a project around it? You already have one from, uh, I, I, I think I know who that is. <laughs> uh, Develop Fee Academy. So for those of you who don't know what a Fee Academy is, it, uh, it is uh, Fee's uh, next big project, actually. Uh, it is a learning platform for uh, the network, for the national operators of the fee programs, uh, but also for teachers uh, later on. Uh, so here we will release uh, yeah, a, a few courses or modules that one can take 
on environmental education and education for sustainable development. Uh, biodiversity garden, that's a very cool project that we've seen uh, very often from eco schools. Um, I'm involved in an Erasmus project. We are lining up, up the content throughout PBL. I'll just scroll through so we see some of the answers we're receiving. Um, Susie, if you want to comment on these. Sure, I see one around entrepreneurship oriented projects during recess. I've seen some great projects around um, designing games for recess, um, games that might use math concepts or health concepts. Um, so that, might, that could have an entrepreneurial spin um, as well. And also projects around COVID-19. I think we're gonna be seeing lots and lots of those, um, you know, in the, the, the weeks ahead. Mm -hmm. um, students try to make sense of what we've all been through. Okay, I'll just move on to the next question. Which 21st uh, century skill do your students need help to develop? So we have uh, four options here. If there's uh, any other you would like to add, you can type it in the chat here on Zoom. I will vote myself. Big need for critical thinking, apparently, um, mm -hmm. which is so important. And just one little tip for those of you who are looking to develop your students' critical thinking and you're designing projects, as you think of a driving question for a project or come up with a driving question, maybe in collaboration with your students, you can kind of embed critical thinking right into that question by asking students things like, what's the best you know, way to keep um, plastics out of the watershed? Or what's the most efficient, you know, this or that? If you have some sort of a qualifier in the driving question that causes students to think about, what are the criteria here? Um, how do I decide what's best or most efficient or most, most affordable or whatever that modifier is? Now I'm having to put on my hat of a critical thinker and analyze different um, possibilities, come up with the best solution. And also, I may have to make an argument and back it up with evidence. Uh, that's another sign of a critical thinker. Um, so, you know, really think hard about yourself as a, a project designer. How can I kind of bake critical thinking right into the project that my students are doing? I ask you a question that you can't answer unless you think critically. Great, I'll just move on to the next. Uh, we actually added one here. Uh, so in one or two words, what is the most important thing for you when implementing a project? Hmm. Oh, I'm happy to see fun in there, you know? Mm -hmm. I think good learning should be fun. <laughs> Definitely. It can, it can sound very serious, some of the um, examples and problem solving that we focus on, but um, there's a certain, uh, you know, value in, in learning being fun and, and joyful at times. Um, mm -hmm. so don't give up on that. that. Those are really important motivators. These are just great examples here, great ideas. You can see engagement and a, a good idea. <laughs> Enjoyment for pupils, yeah, relates back to fun. Fun becomes yeah. bigger. Maybe there's more people thinking that fun yeah. is important. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Wonderful. Great. Thank you very much. And then uh, just a couple of questions about the webinar. So what do you take away from, from uh, this presentation? No, it's actually in full plural, but we mean this one presentation. <laughs> what, so what is the one thing that you can take away from this webinar? So ideas and examples of activities, remote learning ideas, that's, uh, we're happy to contribute to that. Yeah, absolutely, it's so important right now. Okay, the, the resources that uh, um, Susie mentioned uh, from PBL Works and Edutopia. 
Great. Fantastic. Excited to see some people feeling motivated. That's wonderful. Good. And you know, as I mentioned before, you're those of you who are moving in this direction, you're part of a big global community. So the more you can share your own learning, um, whether you do that through blogging or websites or webinars or just talking to your colleagues, um, the richer this all this conversation becomes and the more those really good ideas can kind of travel from one classroom and one teacher to another. So make your learning visible and public just like your students do. Mm -hmm. I can actually see a few uh, in the chat as well from those who didn't manage to get on Mentimeter. Uh, so motivation and learning, uh, getting ready for the next steps. Great. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the last question. Uh, oh. Maybe. There we go. Did you find the webinar useful? <laughs> That's mainly for statistical purposes. Uh, <laughs> so we hope that you enjoyed this. Yeah, nice. I'll just it's yeah, it's fun to see the numbers come through in real time, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Great. Great. Any final remarks from you, Susie, before we close? Um, no, it's, it's exciting to hear about the kind of nice connection between the work that you're doing and the structure of PBL. It just seems like a really natural fit. Um, and I, you know, I just appreciate the global uh, reach that your organization has. It's uh, really wonderful to hear about the good work everyone's doing. So thanks for letting me be part of this. Fantastic. Thank you so much again for joining us. Uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, we will host another uh, webinar on the 21st of April. Um, then uh, some people already uh, asked in the chat about the assessment rubric uh, webinar. In fact, yeah, we are hosting a webinar to explain the rubric and how it works uh, within uh, eco-schools. Um, we already sent out information to all the international schools coordinators and the eco-schools national operators, but if you're interested in joining us, um, yeah, if you're interested in joining eco-schools and want to know how it actually works in terms of assessment, then uh, please drop me an email. I'm typing my email uh, now in the chat. It, it's uh, nicole at fee.global, uh, but you also now have it in the chat. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned earlier, we will basically go through all the uh, performance indicators for uh, achieving the EcoSchools green flag. Uh, and that will be at the end of the month, again, uh, hosted twice uh, to accommodate different time zones, but you will receive the information by email. Uh, otherwise, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks again, Susie, this was amazing. Thank you for uh, joining. Stay safe and healthy, everyone. Yes. Stay safe and healthy. Bye-bye. Yeah. Great. Thanks so much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.